Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the um, new series of um, Gresham Lectures um, on um, astronomy that I'll be uh, giving. Um, so this is the first one, and I'm going to tell you about how stars form. Now, um, when you talk about birth, which I'll be telling you something about, one has to think about death as well. So part of my story will be how they die. Okay, so um, it's all to do really with how we can peer deep into murky clouds in our galaxy and in other galaxies. And it's been a bit of a revolution in, in the past uh, decade or so. So here, for example, is a field of stars that many of us know and love, uh, one of the easiest constellations to see in the sky, Orion. And, um, but in Orion, actually, there are regions in here which uh, turn out to be the birthplace of stars. And they're teeming with newly born stars. Um, uh, it turns out the stars in this particular, we call it a nebula, which you can't even see in, you know, in ordinary light, um, include some very massive stars. And in Taurus, a little further away, um, also in a cloud that you can't see directly on this picture, there are stars like the sun being born. Now, how do we know all of this? Well, um, basically, you have to go into space, first of all, to take photographs at wavelengths that you can't really do very well at on the Earth, um, to see the stars that are much more massive than the sun. They're very hot. You need ultraviolet. And thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, we have beautiful images. And I'm going to show you some. And so the Space Telescope, the Hubble Telescope, um, has been up since 1990. It's only a 2.4 meter telescope, very small. But nevertheless, um, it's uh, been able to do very well for us. Um, and because it's not very high, um, 335 miles, it's been accessible by the Space uh, Shuttle to do repairs. And that's why, in fact, it's, um, our, the astronauts have done a good job repairing it on these two missions um, and refitting it, and so it, it's survived a long time. Um, another telescope, um, launched rather more recently, peered into the infrared. Um, there isn't one more recent than this even, which I'll tell you about soon. This is called the Spitzer Space Infrared Telescope, um, and it was launched in 2003. And it was limited in what it could do because to look in the infrared, you have to cool down your camera. Um, and so one has to have, and the coolants run out after a while. So Spitzer was good and it's now been replaced by, uh, being replaced by other telescopes. Anyway, um, so when you look at this same region of space with um, an infrared telescope, you see something incredibly different. It's full of um, glowing uh, dust particles actually. Um, and um, some of them are hotter than others, and they give you slightly brighter light in this color-coded picture. And that's where stars are buried inside the dust, inside denser parts of the nebula, and um, actually being born. Anyway, I'm going to tell you more about how that all works. Um, but the basic part, important part of the story is that we live in a very dusty universe. It's, you know, you might think it's pollution. Um, it is for the astronomers, actually because the dust particles get in the way of seeing what's going on in the innards of clouds. Um, but here is a star cluster, um, as seen in the optical ultraviolet with the Hubble telescope. You see the very bright dots are very massive stars, and, and the less faint dots are uh, more um, ordinary stars, more like the sun. And, and we know, as I'm going to explain to you, that these massive stars, they die very rapidly, actually. So they're rather young when you see them. So that's why we know we're seeing the birthplace of stars. But you look in the infrared, and this is the nebula you see. And within that nebula, there are many more stars that you don't see in this picture. And the stars buried deep in the nebula are the ones in the process of birth. So this, is, in a sense, is like a cosmic womb um, for us. An amazing story, really. Um, OK, so now let me focus on birth, and then we'll get on to death in a bit. But let's do birth. OK, so one of the most spectacular pictures taken by the Hubble telescope is this one. Um, it's been called, I think, the pillars of creation, among other things. But all we're really looking at are um, regions where there are very massive stars producing lots of hot radiation, hot ionizing photons that destroy um, and uh, 
eject away much of the dust and debris around them, begin to see them, but buried inside the, the, these regions, there are stars yet to be born. And we know that because when we peer inside these regions, um, uh, we uh, can see stars breaking through over here. When we look in the infrared, we can see stars newly forming inside this dark nebulae. So this is um, an example of something very similar to one of these, one of these pillars. And so all of the, this once was you know, a much larger nebula, and all of this stuff has been eaten away by, um, by radiation from young newly formed stars like this one, and these are the densest remnants left over. Um, this is the Eagle Nebula, and the one on the right is the Cone Nebula. Okay, um, so now let's look at the Eagle Nebula in the far infrared. So this is yet another telescope. This is the more, a more recent one called the Herschel Space Telescope. It's a bigger one, three and a half meters in diameter. And the beauty of it is, is that it looks at very, very long wavelengths. We call this the far infrared. And now the longer the wavelength, in some sense, the cooler uh, the dust must be that emits at that wavelength. Um, and so you're looking now at the coldest, densest parts of the nebula. And, um, and within that, and it's color coded, so don't be fooled by the colors as thinking that it's that there's any warmth or heat in here. This, this stuff is all relatively cold, but there are some regions that are warmer than others, and those are the regions which are be, where, where stars are actually forming in these bright spots over here inside this very dense dark nebula. So here's an example of, of this. Um, tele, this is this, the Herschel telescope. Um, it's actually in a very interesting orbit, um, one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth um, on the opposing side from the sun, which is what we call a Lagrange point. It's a very stable point, so the telescope can more or less, the, the, the gravity of, uh, of, the very, of its orbit more or less is balanced by that of the sun, so it can stay there essentially uh, while only receiving a very small correct, correcting boost, and it's not bothered by sunlight because the sun's on the opposite side of the Earth. Um, anyway, it's a great place to do astronomy, this Lagrange point, and um, that's where many more satellites are being put eventually um, uh, in the future. So here is the far infrared view of the Eagle Nebula. Okay, now there are many, many more regions that we've mapped out, and these are just beautiful pictures. Um, the colors are slightly artificial in the sense they're, they're coded to give you relative change in temperature. Um, the, 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 the darker, the browner, the, the cooler, the, 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 the whiter, in some cases the, the greener, the, the, the slightly warmer stuff. But in all these cases, you see um, nebulosity clouds, basically. Um, like thunder clouds and things are happening inside them. A storm, you know, lightning will arise, etc. things break out. In some sense, that, that's, you have to think of these clouds in space as they're subject not to thunderstorms, but, but to actually break out of star formation. I'll explain why that works. And that produces energy that heats up and partially destroys the clouds. And you're seeing the process of cloud destruction revealing the stars being born underneath. Um, so this nebula is uh, one of the more beautiful ones called the Horsehead Nebula, because if you squint at it carefully, you can see a shape that might look like a horse's head. Um, um, and there's one over here called the Monkey Nebula. Again, I'm not quite sure where these names all came from, but in any, any case, if you look hard enough, you can... But, okay, so over here we have the stars basically heating up and breaking out in some cases, and many of these are brighter spots in the dark cloud are, are stars in the process of being born. Um, uh, here, there's a whole cluster of stars buried beneath the dust. Um, we're actually looking at this. This picture was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is an, an, a very near infrared optical picture. But nevertheless, um, when you look at this in the infrared, you, you would see far more stars than you hear. An, another beautiful example. And uh, the Omega Nebula, uh, again, I'm not sure where the name comes from. Maybe you can vaguely see an Omega shape there, but the, the, here where stars are being born. Here stars have been born, and they've eaten away at the dark, dark, dark heated up the gas, and you can see um, uh, light from the stars being reflected and diffused by the dust grains. That's why you don't see a single bright star, because the dust scatters. It's like looking through a fog, basically. And um, one of the more beautiful examples is this one, um, and I'll come back to this. This is the Carina Nebula, where again you see these, uh, these regions uh, um, in which stars are forming and regions where stars have recently formed. And it's all very active uh, 
uh, stuff that you just get no, no idea. If you looked at this in the optical, you'd just see blackness over here, basically, with four, a few foreground stars. If you ever looked at the Milky Way at night, you notice there are regions which, where you see apparently very few stars, other stars around them. Those dark regions are just huge dust clouds. When you look in the far infrared especially, they light up in these uh, uh, and show you this amazing activity going on that's buried from, from our normal telescopes, and which you can only see in space. Okay, because the Earth's atmosphere is very good at blocking most of this interesting long wavelength radiation. Um, and we have a neighbor, uh, near, the nearest galaxy to us, the large Magellanic Cloud. And again, if those of you who have seen this um, in the Southern Hemisphere from Australia, maybe, well, you know, it, it's a beautiful thing, but it's just a, a fuzzy spot on the sky. That's all you can see with the naked eye. When you look with telescopes, you can resolve it into stars. But when you... Um, look with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can suddenly see this exquisite pattern of, this is a, a whole cluster, millions of stars, with some of the most massive stars that we know in the central region um, being formed. And, and those stars, as I'll explain, are intrinsically rather young, just millions of years old. Remember, our Earth is four and a half billion years old. Our sun is about four and a half billion years old, but these stars are just millions of years old. They're, they're youngsters, and they presumably they come and go. We're just seeing the recent generation of them. And over here is a dark cloud where, um, again, when you peer in at longer wavelengths, you can see many more stars, and this is waiting um, to, be, uh, to emerge. They're waiting, the new stars are waiting for them in this region over here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Um, when you look at the very center of the Milky Way, that's near the constellation of Sagittarius, that's low on the horizon in the northern hemisphere, you can see it well from the southern hemisphere, um, with a, uh, again, with an infrared telescope in this case, you, I mean, again, it's just darkness. I mean, if you look at it with, a, with an optical telescope, um, but in the infrared, you suddenly see it's teeming with activity. And the center of the galaxy is roughly in the, in the middle of this picture, the actual geometrical center, where there's a huge black hole lurking, actually. I'm not going to talk about that today. But that, um, you know, it's a dynamic place to be, lots of things going on. And we have no idea about this with our ordinary telescopes until we began the adventures of infrared astronomy to peer deep into these things. So that, that's how we've begun to understand where the stars are forming. Okay, so um, I'll try to explain what a star is. Um, our galaxy contains a lot of stars, something like 100 billion stars, um, uh, mostly uh, not too different from the sun, um, um, but some of them are much more massive than our sun is, and the massive stars actually have a short lifetime because they consume their fuel, I'll explain what it is in a moment very quickly, uh, in millions of years, and they explode. And I'll show you the explosions in a moment. And the explosions of the debris from the star form the dust that you see in, in, um, in the pictures I showed you, um, and the interstellar clouds. And from those clouds, new generations of stars will form. So our sun is produced from the ashes of previous generations of stars, and the Earth in particular, and we in particular, all that we're made of, we, our atoms once went through this, this fiery, fi fiery furnace of, of, of stars. Um, we, we're the relics of all that in some sense. We're formed from the ashes of stars. Okay, so how then are stars actually formed? Let's try to um, shed some light on that. Um, so historically, um, James Jeans was um, a well-known astronomer and science popularizer uh, the, in the early years of the 20th century. Um, and he had really a, a brilliant insight into why it is that a cloud of gas would, um, would, would make stars. So he said that if this cloud of gas becomes large enough, it accretes enough matter by bumping into other gas clouds which stick to it, much like... Um, you know, you see clouds build up in the sky, when, especially when a storm is coming. They, they're very sticky things. They aggregate together, they coalesce together. He argued that, well, clouds in our galaxy would, would aggregate together. And eventually, they become massive enough 
So their own gravity takes over. Now, this never happens to clouds in the Earth's atmosphere. They're far too light for that. But in the interstellar medium, one can really accrete millions of solar masses worth of gas eventually. And I'll explain a little bit how that's done in a moment. But once you do this, once gravity is important, then gravity causes the gas to collapse. The cloud, whole cloud collapses under its gravity. It just can't resist anymore. Now, what happens is a diffuse gas cloud can cool down rather easily, okay? And so genes realize that this cloud under gravity, there'd be no resistance to gravity, it would cool down. And as it cooled down, it would automatically have to break up into smaller bits and pieces um, as the cloud got denser. Um, and these smaller fragments, he said, would be the stars, and eventually the, the fragments of even the smallest clouds that made the stars would be the planets. So that was his insight. And he showed that it was just really a competition between um, the gravity which caused wanted to make the cloud collapse and the ability of the cloud to stop gravity by just having pressure, atoms bouncing, bouncing around. But if they lost energy by cooling into space, that, that resistance would weaken. Okay, and so then the cloud would shrink and break up. Okay, so that didn't quite... If you think about it, I mean, that says, fine, clouds break up into smaller clouds, but why stars? And it was interesting, um, around the same time, another um, pioneering English astronomer called Arthur Eddington had a, a tremendous insight into why there had to be stars. And he said, um, just imagine a physicist who always lived on a cloudy planet, okay? She could never see the stars, he said. Maybe he said he in those days, right? But whatever. And anyway, um, one could, she could deduce there had to be stars. It was inevitable, given our knowledge of clouds. And um, uh, so clouds ha stars have to be there. And the, the, so the logic of that is interesting. Uh, I'm going to explain that to you. But let's now just look at a cloud. Um, so this is um, a typical cloud as seen in the optical part of the spectrum with ordinary telescopes, okay? Even the Hubble Space Telescope would see a cloud like this. And we see many of these in the Milky Way, and it's only when you look in the infrared that you realize that this is teeming with young stars. Um, but anyway, this is a dark cloud, and it's dark because there's dust, a lot of dust along with the gas, and the dust absorbs starlight, okay? And so you just don't, it just looks black, and the stars you see here are stars in the foreground between us and the cloud. Um, and so you see none of these many background stars when you look at this. Okay, so this is a typical womb for star formation. Okay, um, and this cloud, when it grows and it get, acquires enough mass, the running into other clouds will then be the birthplace of stars. So that's the idea. So we see some clouds which don't make stars. They're starless clouds, a few. Um, they're the precursor stage, and we see many that apparently are forming stars. Okay, um, so here again is... Um, a beautiful image um, from a, an infrared telescope of a star forming region in, in our Milky Way. And again, uh, this is, these are the stars that have burnt away their surroundings, emerged from the shrouds of dust. Um, and these regions are still shrouded by dust and, and these are just stars in the foreground. And, and you can infer there's stars inside them because regions of the dust are heat being heated up. And this is where star, 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 stars are actively forming. And in these regions, they will form in the future. We're certain just by extrapolation. And here there's been some really impressive activity in forming stars. So this is the way things go. Um, you know, the, way, the reason we're so interested in these pictures is that you know, it's a bit like um, you're looking at a population, population of stars. So when you study people, you go to a large enough city and then you have a sample of you know, young people, babies, old people, sick people, well people, etc., etc. You see all, all sorts of things with a large enough population. So that's why we astronomers care about building up this catalogue of clouds with many, many environments, and they're going to catch the young stars, the new stars, the 2B stars, and the dead stars and the dying stars. They'll all be there just as they are in any, in any population. So that's why it's so important to, to analyse all these images and to get them in the first place, which is not easy, because the Earth's atmosphere, and you know, good for us, because otherwise we'd be burnt up by the UV, et cetera, and other horrible radiation. It blocks out much of this interesting stuff, um, and we have to go uh, into space to see this stuff. The infrared actually is blocked out by water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. That, you know, water's a good thing to have, but again, if you go to the moon, that's a great place to do astronomy. There's no atmosphere. You're not blocked out, so that in the future, I'm sure we'll be having telescopes on the moon, but that's another story. 
Okay. Um, so now let's zero in to a very young star where we've been able to get images um, uh, by peering through the infrared. This was taken with the Herschel Space Telescope. So this is an example of, um, of a star, a very young star in the center. And it's surrounded by um, what looks like a, a disk or a, um, or a ring of uh, material. And um, in this corner uh, of the ring, there's um, uh, an object which probably is going to be something like Jupiter in the future, that is a, a massive planet. Um, and from this uh, disk, which you can barely resolve with this telescope, um, we infer this it probably is the precursor from which the planets were made. And uh, because we don't know exactly how planets are made and we need smaller bodies to build up into them, we've entered a word for that and we call them planetesimals. You can think of them as a huge crowd of asteroids or rocks in space, similar to what we see around Saturn, actually. Saturn's rings are a nice laboratory for studying how structures, how moons might form. Um, the rings of Saturn are future moons, perhaps, in, you know, um, and it, of course it has its many satellites of its own where it's clear the path through those rings. Anyway, so here we think is a space where um, um, an example of a young star with a future that will include planets. Okay, so this is one of the latest, most impressive images I want to show you of, um, which tells a lot about how planets are formed. So this is um, one of the nearest um, young stars to us um, in the constellation of Taurus. And um, it, this has been imaged with, um, uh, with a telescope. I'll show you a picture in a second. It's a, it's a telescope which works at microwave wavelengths. Um, it's a whole series of telescopes, actually. And the microwaves can peer even more deeply into the dust than any infrared telescope can. And it's come up with this amazing image. And so what you can see, there's a star in the middle. This is its name, HL Taurus. Astronomers use alphabetical coding, and Taurus is the constellation of Taurus. Um, and it's surrounded by a series of disks. And there are, break, there are gaps in between the disks. So this is very reminiscent of um, what we found with the Cassini spacecraft when it imaged the rings around Saturn. It saw rings, gaps, and satellites. And so we think this is the early stage before even the planets are formed. Um, where we're looking at um, potentially there may be planets inside these gaps sweeping up the material, um, or maybe they have some other origin. But in any case, all this stuff is the future, you know, dusty rings which will coalesce in the future into, um, in, in, into planets. So that's, um, and this star, we know from how bright it is, how cold it is, it's only 100,000 years old. It's the youngest star that we've ever found. Okay? So it's a beautiful thing to, um, to stare at. And this is the Alma telescopes. If ever you go to the Atacama Desert in Chile at 16,000 feet, you'll find this array of 66 radio telescopes Okay, paid for by um, Europe, by the USA, and by Japan. Each of them is 10 or 12 meters across. Um, and, um, and basically, they, they, they use microwaves. And uh, because microwaves are so penetrating, um, they can peer deep into clouds, into the densest clouds. Um, and so that's uh, um, uh, the way we're studying how planets are being born. And the most interesting case is this one. So this is actually, um, we think, an Earth-like planet information. So here is, here is another object um, in the constellation of Hydra, a very young star also. Um, million, this star is a million years old. Again, we'll probably see and we, again, we see these gaps and rings. And then what Alma was able to do, as you, the, those telescopes I showed you, that they're, they're movable. You can move them further apart. And so when you extend the separation to the maximum distance in, on the Atacama Desert, where they have you know, the rails and all this stuff set up for this, that the further apart they are, the more resolution you get. That gives you, it's like parallax, right? You have a longer baseline. So when they zoomed in at the very central region, right? And this turns out to be roughly the Earth-Sun distance now, okay? So we're looking at the place uh, before the, the disk I showed you was way beyond, you know, uh, the orbit of Jupiter or something. It was you know, just one massive planet. But in this case, we're looking in at the region where an Earth-like planet could form. And amazingly, 
we see the star here, and then on this roughly Earth-Sun distance scale, which is roughly this, we see a ring and lumps in the ring, which suggest that the planetesimals are at work, they're accreting together, wait another few hundred thousand years, no doubt, they'll all merge and just leave one. You know, it's like, um, you know, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the biggest one is going to dominate eventually, and that'll be the Earth-like twin um, that we've been looking for for so long, um, uh, you know, in formation. Um, so it's, uh, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, planets are forming everywhere. Um, and this, just remember, this is just a star only a couple of hundred light years away from, from us. That's why we can resolve it in so much detail. Uh, our galaxy is teeming with hundreds of billions of stars and presumably hundreds of billions of planets. Um, and who knows how many, what fraction of those will be at the right sort of Earth-Sun distance to be so-called Earth-like planets and, you know, with all sorts of interesting consequences, which we are just beginning to explore. Okay, um, so here's an artist's conception. So this is something that we cannot quite resolve yet with our biggest telescopes. So the artist then, um, from the Keck Observatory, um, said, well, okay, so here we have our, our young star, and we have these disks of debris around it, and they're going to be in this early stage of aggregation, running into each other, and they eventually will coalesce, and the biggest ones in each orbit will dominate and be planets. And then it's interesting, so at the outer part, it's very, very cold, a long way from... Uh, so near the, the young star, it's fairly hot, and only the, the most um, heat-resistant heat materials survive, okay? That is, if you have ice, that will just ev evaporate, right? Volatilize. So if you go far enough away, you have icy debris. If you're close, you have, you know, rock-like debris. And so this is sort of why the Earth is a rock-like planet. So is Mars, um, so is Venus, um, uh, but when you get to Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, there it's so cold that you have, you know, most of the planet is, is basically um, volatiles, gas and ice, okay? Far enough, or Pluto, for example, too. So there is a rocky core inside, but it's a fairly small one, whereas opposite is true for the inner planet. Anyway, that, so that's the artist's view. Okay, so um, why is it that we're so sure that um, stars can be age-dated from how bright they burn so the bright, how, how bright they shine. So the brighter they are, uh, the more they use up their energy supply and the less time they have to live. Now, the big discovery um, uh, after Ellington conjectured that stars had to be there, and I didn't really explain why that had to be, but the reason was that stars are this continuing battle between pressure and gravity, and there's a sweet spot, as it were, where the two can balance each other, and Eddington realized that, and uh, that's how he conjectured that that was a natural place to be. But let's now imagine that um, we have a series of possible masses of stars. It turns out that um, the supply of fuel comes from nuclear reactions, it's thermonuclear fusion, basically, which powers stars, and this was realized in the 1930s, um, 1940s, I studied in most detail then. Uh, Addington didn't actually know that, but nevertheless he conjectured about stars. But anyway, so we know now what the fuel supply is. We've even tested that by matching the debris from the reactions with observations. So we've actually measured neutrinos, ghostly particles, produced only by nuclear reactions from the sun, proving the sun really is burning by thermonuclear fusion. Okay, the same reactions basically to power a hydrogen bomb. Um, now someday we'll, we'll master that on the Earth and have a new generation of energy reactors powered by fusion. The beauty of that will be in the future, in a century's time or more, no doubt, is that we'll be using hydrogen as our fuel, um, just as stars use hydrogen, and there's a huge supply of that in the ocean, so we will not ever run out of fuel. And what is more, by sticking with hydrogen as your fuel, that's radioactively a very, very clean supply because you're not making anything heavy like uranium or whatever, the radioactive isotopes that are, that are reasonably toxic. Okay, anyway, so that's um, by the way, but stars do burn peacefully, for the most part, on thermonuclear reactions. So it turns out, though, that the energy the star loses while its fuel supply just depends on how much mass it has, the more massive stars have more fuel, it's a very... Um, prolificate, 
prolific user of um, fuel. And the amount of fuel it uses goes roughly as the cube of the mass. So at one solar mass star will burn a certain amount like the sun does, but a star that's 10 times the mass of our sun will burn and shine a thousand times more than the sun does. It'll use up its fuel a thousand times more. So we know just from the simple arguments that balance gravity and pressure uh, that stars, more massive ones, do shine much more, and that's how we infer um, their masses, actually. Um, but we now can estimate how long they will live because they've run out of fuel. And that's why we're sure that, say, a star that's 30 times the mass of the sun will only survive a million years. The sun will keep on going for 10 billion years. Okay? Um, it's, uh, we've got a long future ahead. We're not going to, you know, you may worry what will happen to the Earth in, you know, when the sun does die. I'll explain that. But we do have a long way to go. Okay? So in billions of years, who knows what may happen on the Earth? We have a, you know, a long way ahead of us. This sort of thing does make you think for a bit. The sun itself is halfway along, only 5 billion years old, 4.6 4 actually, but there are other stars around us that are um, a little bit less massive than the sun that were formed long before the sun that may be billions of years older than our sun, several billion years older even. And if they have planets, you know, that leads you to all sorts of conjectures about what they may, you know, what state they may be in if um, their planetary inhabitants uh, didn't uh, care too much about climate change, or if they did, whatever. Um, anyway... Um, so that's another story. But anyway, so um, a million years is a tiny instant in the time of the Milky Way. And we're seeing stars come and go all the time. And that's the beauty of these um, infrared telescopes. And we should see now stars not just being born, but stars dying. So I've talked about star birth. But now um, let me tell you a bit about star death. OK, so fortunately, our sun is going to die what I will call a gentle death. Now, it may not seem so gentle to some of you in a moment, but anyway, but there are stars that will explode and have a much more violent death. And those are the massive stars where they have much more mass. And so when they go bad, bad things can happen. Okay? When they exhaust their fuel, bad things can happen. The sun, because it's got less mass, will die more quiescently eventually. Okay? That's a few billion years ago. So this is a forecast really based on studying the populations around us of what will happen to the star in about four billion years time, to our sun in, in about four billion years time. So here is, um, there's a star in, in the center, um, which you can um, see over there, I think. And that's a very compact star. It's called a white dwarf star. It's, it's what happens when the parent star collapsed, ran out of fuel and collapsed, and, left, and heated up as it collapsed, and left this very compact remnant behind with no ability to get any more energy from it by burning. Um, but at the same time, the outer parts all expanded into what we call a planetary nebula. They're good planets, but we, these are beautiful objects that are the debris from this uh, dying star. And um, to give you some feeling for the scale, I mean, around this central star, there'll be planets, and they will be overtaken by this debris uh, and impacted. Now, that in itself is not the worst of it. The worst thing would have happened before then, um, but let's just look at one or two more cases of white dwarf. So here's a beautiful example where um, as this uh, star, the star that preceded this one, aged, it went through a series of puffing out you know, shells of gas as it gradually, erratically, you know, bits of fuel came in and from, you know, the star was a little bit spinning and a bit, in, you know, dying not in a regular way, but, you know, uh, panting, as it were, puffing and panting and going through periods of convulsion, if you like. And so eventually, you know, uh, th these are the remnants of all that, and this very compact star, we call it a white dwarf, is, is what's left behind. Okay, so that's uh, the sort of thing, and th um, another beautiful example of, um, um, so some of the deaths of stars are slightly more, uh, uh, more gentle than that, and then th this is an example of, of, of a star that, again, has left its white dwarf behind, and here's all the outer material, um, you know, maybe a, f a tenth of the mass that once was in the star, maybe more, is being blown out as a shell. And this is the debris um, that will pollute other clouds. So what is interesting is one of the most important elements um, that is responsible for life on the Earth is carbon. And we believe strongly that the stars like this um, uh, are responsible for producing carbon. So this nebula is, is often rich, rich with carbon, and that carbon get mixed into the gas, gas and hydrogen, and from then new stars will form. 
um, and uh, which would be more carbon rich and eventually be able to have the right ingredients for, for, you know, for life as it developed on the earth, for example. But before then, it would have been rather hard. Okay, um, now let's turn to um, the massive counterparts. So those were stars that were of order roughly, you know, one or twice the size of the mass of the sun, okay? Um, and I should say that, you know, the bad news for the earth would be, of course, that these, that these remnants, the hot gas that, that comes out from the star as it dies will, will overtake the earth and burn it up, basically. Burn up the atmosphere anyway, maybe not the rocky core of the earth. And so the Earth, if you think we're doing bad things to, to climate change, imagine what a dying, the dying sun will do. But that, that is a long time away. So presumably we'll have solved that solution uh, or left the Earth or whatever. But, you know, that's four billion years in the future. So. Okay, anyway, so let's now turn to a more short-lived star. This is a massive star, 30 times about the sun. And as it dies, um, what happens? So first of all, it, you know, it, it began with pure hydrogen. It burnt the hydrogen to helium by thermonuclear fusion. Then when a round of helium, it would shrink a bit, and then it would start burning the helium, and the helium burns into carbon. But then, as it runs out more, it makes nitrogen. Eventually, it makes iron. Now, iron has the property of being the most stable of all the elements. Once you've made iron, you can't get any more energy out of it by nuclear burning. That's it. Okay, it's the ultimate stability. It's like a the stars turned into a gigantic slag heap, if you were, okay? But a very, very compact ball of iron. Okay, and so that's what's left. But in the meantime, so much energy is released at the end with this final collapse that there's a huge explosion. And that we call a supernova explosion. And it's from the, those ashes, all this other stuff, um, mostly the heavier elements, the nitrogen and the heavier stuff, um, that you know, end up being very important for, um, again, producing... Um, or the, uh, most of the material, the solid material in the solar system, for example. And so these are different stages that you might um, see for this massive star. So here is um, a massive star before it, it explodes. And it goes through a, a phase when it, um, it's a bit unstable. And again, you see this ionizing glow of a shell of material that was ejected. Okay, and these, are these objects are beautiful things to photograph on the sky. So we see many of them, they have a particular name, more Frey stars. And here's another star that we think is going to be a supernova very soon, okay, because it really is going through, you know, unstable phases. We see it varying from year to year, the weird things going on, and there's a massive star in the middle, and it's already been ejecting lots of gas, but we think one day it's going to go boom, and that'll be it for that one, any time. Um, you know, it's, it's thousands of light years away, so there's no immediate problem for us. But, and so here, again, is a beautiful case of a of a star after the explosion. So in the center, you see the iron object that's left behind. What is that? It's gotten so compact that we call that a neutron star. It's even smaller than a white dwarf. It's as though the whole star has shrunk into basically, um, you know, the size of London, actually, okay? Um, or, or even a tenth of that, okay? It's just miles across, um, that star. Um, and, uh, but that's the remnant of the explosion. And th because this has shrunk to such a, it's got such a small size, unlike the white dwarf, which is a thousand times bigger, where you get what I call gentle energy. Here it's violent, you've shrunk so much, so much energy comes out that that's, that's the explosion. And that causes this rapidly moving nebula, which then expands. Um, and we can follow the progress of that nebula for a long time by looking at objects in the sky that are at different stages of their evolution. So um, here are some examples. So these are some of the most, be again, beautiful things in the sky. So these are supernova, the remnants of supernovae. And these were seen, some of them, on the Earth. Let me take you through the history of this. The Crab Nebula, okay, seen by Chinese, um, I'm not sure I call them astron astronomers, um, uh, you know, maybe they had astrology in those days or related things, whatever, but they saw a star come and go over the course of less than a year. Um, and uh, when we look in the same place and they were good enough to give us the where, tell us where to look, okay, in the, in the ancient Chinese records, lo and behold, one sees this magnificent nebula expanding at a thousand kilometers a second, okay? And if you follow that back in time, bingo, 1054 AD, that's where it came from. And in the center, we've discovered a neutron star spinning rapidly. We call those pulsars, okay? Um, because they beam radio waves at us. Um, here's another one. Um, 
uh, found by um, Tycho Brahe, first seen in 1572. This is how it looks today, as seen with um, an X-ray satellite um, and uh, telescope, and, and this, this expanding nebul nebulosity with this very hot shell emitted glowing X-rays around it. Um, this is an infrared view of the, of the crab, seeing that lots of dust is being created in, in this explosion too. That's where some of the dust comes in the, from in the universe. Um, uh, and another famous astronomer, um, uh, Kepler, Johannes Kepler, also found one um, about 30 years after Tycho Brahe. And this is the remnant of his supernova seen today. Magnificent, glowing in X-rays because they're expanding so rapidly. Um, and, um, and then if you go back to the earliest one that we've found, again in Chinese records, I think there's, there's some arguments for this, not as good as for the crab. This is the remnant, of, but they did tell us where to look, and this is where we look now, in 386 AD. And that's as you see it today. So that's, that's wonderful. Uh, not everyone has been seen, though. This is, a, this is another one in Cassiopeia, which we can date from the expansion as being 300 years old. Now, 300 years ago, that, you know, that's 1717 or whatever, but nobody reported it. It's amazing. This should have been you know, brighter than Venus, whatever, and lasted just a, you know, a few months. But there's no record of any, no human record of, anything, of this being reported. So that's uh, one of the big puzzles we, as we have. This is an X-ray view of, of Cassiopeia A, which is a very bright radio source too. That's what the A means there. Okay, so those were hundreds of a thousand years ago, but we see lots more over a longer time scale because more stars have exploded. So we can see stars, explosions, remnants of supernovae that are 10,000 years old. And here are a few of them. And they're beautiful things. Um, so this is, uh, you know, hundreds of light years across here. This is called the Cygnus Loop. So it's glowing in the optical. And if you look at part of this in the X-rays, it looks really, you know, just expanding shockwaves basically, heating up the, 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 the gas around them. And this is a similar image in the ultraviolet um, of, the, of the, all this rich material in here. So, th so these are, are interesting objects. Um, again, here are some more of them after 10,000 years. Um, so the, this is the relic of a massive star that exploded 10,000 years ago. There's not much left behind, but if you look at it in the X-rays, typically um, you can begin to pick something up. Or, or in the ultraviolet light. So this is one in, in, the, in, the, in the Vela constellation. You see, and all these little rings are bits of debris from the massive star doing stuff before the explosion, ejecting pulses of bits of its material. And then the huge blast wave from the supernova running into it. Okay, and that's why the shock, you see shocks curving around these things. Okay, and then, um, but you know, not, not all stars die again in this more, um, you know, chaotic way. Here's one that clearly left a very smooth environment around it, and this is the remnant that we see now, an almost perfectly spherical shell. Here's another old one too, okay. Okay, um, so let me tell you briefly um, the idea behind Eddington's conjecture. I just want to explain this a little more deeply than I did before. So Eddington told us that clouds fragment and break up as they shrink down. And so this shows you the, uh, the history of, again, what genes, James Jeans defined as the critical mass to break up into stars. So Jeans gave that, and, and Eddington ran with it. Okay? And so, so the two between them, they realized that as the cloud got denser and denser as it shrank, um, the critical mass for it to break up that Jeans claimed was when you ran out of pressure, got smaller and smaller as you get denser and denser. But then, um, then Basically, Eddington realized that at some point, the cloud would begin to get opaque. It couldn't let its radiation out. And radiation pressure builds up, and then the cloud has to stop fragmenting. Okay, so that was the idea. And um, basically, from the sort of arguments, um, simple arguments, not so different from Eddington's, you can figure out um, what it is that it takes um, you know, is there some special value this might have? And, it, and you can show, I mean, anything conjectured was the balance of radiation and, and mass that limited the mass of the star. Um, but you can, can, you can show in a more, much simpler way that the, the minimum mass here just depends on fundamental constants. It turns out to be a fraction of the mass of the sun uh, with almost no assumptions whatsoever. So this cloud, a la gene, should break up into small bits. Unfortunately, that's not the right answer for making stars. Now, we see these small bits... They might be asteroids or planets or something, um, free-floating ones perhaps, but they're not stars. And the only way we make stars is because stuff falls into them. 
okay, and they grow. So you make the cloud breaks up. It's a bit like Humpty Dumpty and putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. So the cloud builds up by what we call accretion. Okay, so that's the combination. And the accretion, now then you ask why on earth is the cloud built up in something enormous? I mean, if you only massive stars, why are solar type stars left behind? And the answer, again, is another bit of physics, and this just shows you how complicated the whole story is. It's to do with magnetic fields. So let me show you how that works. Magnetic fields are everywhere in the universe, and in particular, they act like sources of tension. Okay, and if you wind up a magnetic field, it resists gravity. So here is fields permeating this cloud done from a numerical simulation, and the, and the fields twist up. And that stops the collapse eventually, okay? And it gives you so much energy as you compress a field that actually generates outbursts. Okay, and indeed, this is an example of a, of a young star, um, and it's actually shedding stuff, okay? So let me, I'm gonna show you more examples of that in a second. So here is um, what we call a star, a very young star, it's known not to be powered by nuclear reactions yet, we think it's a million years old, and apparently it's shedding all this stuff. So this star has stopped its accretion. This is why stars end up being, most of them, just like the sun in mass, a few resist this and get to much higher masses. Um, and this is the sort of shedding that, that's happening. And this shedding process is very exciting because it happens everywhere we see young stars. And so this is critical for understanding the structures of the nebulae and why not everything forms stars, why there's so much gas around. So we, here are examples of two star-forming nebulae, and all of these projections you see are ejector from, from the young stars like these. They eject stuff because of the winding up of the fields, and that's what limits the mass of stars. So that's, a, and again, a great discovery from peering into these clouds with the big infrared telescopes. Okay, and in this, coming back to the Carina Nebula, here's a close-up, one of the most beautiful of all the space telescope images. You can see all these jets and things where you're basically from the stars being formed that are stopping too much gas occurring. So this is a great, a great um, these images are great inspiration for our artists, I'm sure. Um, and the other side of the story is that another way we see this energy from the young stars is their X-ray sources too. So here is an X-ray telescope launched in 1999, still, still taking data. Um, X-rays are hard things to, to focus, right? But nevertheless, you can design X-ray telescopes and it can work. And these red things are X-rays, which can penetrate these scopes. We can see them from young stars. So lots of hot young stars blowing, accreting stuff, blowing stuff out, energizing themselves and being... And so that, that all proves that, you know, there's a, a, a whole wealth of things going on in the nebulae that make young stars. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, we're left with this... Um, a rich field of stars, um, young stars, old stars, everything, when the dust has all been blown away. And, um, and the stars are not alone, and many of them like to form in clusters. Here's a beautiful example of a globular star cluster, several hundred of these that are around the Milky Way, in the Milky Way galaxy, with each one with millions of stars in, mostly old stars. Here, the, the, all the younger stars are long since dead. So this has only the stars that are as old as the sun, basically, um, and older. Okay, so final point is why on earth the clouds collapse, okay? Um, why do they grow? I said gravity does it all, but why, how, why do they get to this critical point? So the idea is that the clouds move around the galaxy in circles. So here's an image of our galaxy, um, a real image, and you can't see much, but we've reconstructed a map of the galaxy from three-dimensional tomography of, of, of this image, of looking at the stars, getting their distances. Um, and, and you learn that in the center of the galaxy, there's a huge bar-shaped area of stars, and the other stars are in orbits going around what we call the spiral arms. Okay, now, the stars go in circular orbits, basically. It's a rotating disk. But as this bar, which swings around, it perturbs the orbits of the stars. And basically, it's like creating congestion on the highway, okay? You're causing some stars to slow down, others to speed up. Your, your deviations from, from the circular paths. And in this cosmic traffic jam, the clouds collide, then they coalesce together, and they become massive enough to make stars. And what is more, because the outer parts of the galaxy spin, have roughly the same rotation as the inner part, that means in, in the inside, the speed's the same, the, the, cl the clouds can orbit more rapidly, the things wind up into a spiral structure. So that's where we get these beautiful spiral arms that this map shows and we see in galaxies like this. So these are basically, this is thought to be the twin of our galaxy more or less, 
Um, and this is something similar seen from a different perspective, the Andromeda gal galaxy. And these are where the young stars are forming because of the clouds that have collided. And um, this is um, the same sort of thing happening with a different perspective um, as seen in uh, a, a galaxy yeah, from 12 million light years away. So there you have the story. I've taken you from star birth to um, uh, star death and back to formation and back to a whole grand universe um, full of... Each galaxy has 100 billion stars. Now, the universe, as so far seen through the biggest telescopes, um, probably has uh, you know, 100 billion galaxies in it, um, similar mass to these. So it, it makes us um, just wonder what all the potential of this will be for the next generations of astronomers. There have been many things to discover. So thank you. <clears throat> So I think we have time for a few questions. Okay, so I think you should wait for the microphone. Um, um, do we know what the mechanism was for the very, very first generation of stars after the Big Bang? Because there were no seeds, for want of a better word, to, to, to cause star formation. So that, that's a good question. So how do you make um, the first stars if you don't have these, um, uh, th this carbon or whatever the, uh, to help you make molecules that can cool down, atoms that can help the nebula cool down? So the answer is um, it's difficult, but you do have one. Uh, what you have is abundant hydrogen, that's for sure. And um, the hydrogen will occasionally form molecules of hydrogen. And so in the first clouds... There are some hydrogen molecules. Now, a hydrogen molecule um, is two atoms, but just like a hydrogen atom, which has electrons in different energy states, and if you can excite it by colliding with another atom, then um, the, the, the energy state gets lowered as the electron falls down, you, you radiate energy. The same thing happens with molecules, because they can also vibrate, they can spin, they have different energy levels. So again, if, when they collide with atoms, um, they were, will be excited and, and, and they will radiate. And their radiation is in the infrared and escapes freely from the first cloud. So we think that's the trick the first clouds have and, uh, and the first stars. Uh, and the interesting consequence of that is that because um, these hydrogen molecules, the first molecules, are not very good, very effective at cooling, but they do cool, the, the first clouds that make the first stars are much warmer than today's clouds. And so that means they, they, will, they will make predominantly massive stars. So we think the first generation of stars was stars maybe 100 times the mass of the sun from the simple argument. So that's how we think started. Yeah, so... Uh, you mentioned the formation of elements in, in stars, but you didn't go on to talk about supernovas. My understanding is that the heavier elements were formed in supernova e explosions. Is that correct? And are we going to see more elements? So that's absolutely right. So, so um, in, in the supernova, you have um, elements like silicon and oxygen, um, which are um, stay in shells of gas around when the centre of the star collapses, and they all get a different explosion. So the supernova remnants are rich in these elements, and uh, they're very important. And so they're made in the course of evolution of a massive star. The low mass star tends to finish its lifetime. Before it's had much time to make these elements, the supernova has time to do it, and then everything gets ejected. And you can even, um, in a more complicated way, make the rare elements, the heavier elements, um, uh, because some of the stuff, it, during the explosion, falls back onto this central, very, very hot, you know, neutron star that's forming, and you get extra reactions that can even take you further up the periodic table. So we, we think everything, in principle, comes from a combination of stars like the planetary nebulae and supernova. Between the two, one can explain most of what we see. Uh, it's not a proof exactly, but the model seems to hang together. Maybe we'll time for one more question. We're running out here. Do we know how, how much after the Big Bang was there light? 
Okay, so the question is, how long after the Big Bang was the first light? Yeah. Okay, so um, the, we refer to something called the Dark Ages, which is when there were no stars at all. And that was um, something like began, um, or maybe I should say ended about a billion years ago. So essentially, you know, 13 or 14 billion years after the Big Bang, the first stars were made, and that was the age of light, if you like. Many more stars were made after that, and that um, is, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, the end of it. And we do be we're beginning to see the Dark Ages where there were very few stars, so we, we, we think the story holds together. So I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much, and I look forward to meeting you in a month's time.